Students, families, counselors, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for the Missouri ACAC Virtual College Fair. First, today we've got some panels, and the Virtual College Fair is tomorrow. So I want to highlight a few housekeeping items on today's panel and then hand it over to our amazing panelists for today. First and foremost, you are encouraged to ask questions throughout this session via the Q&A button that you see in your screen. When you send in your question, it gets sent just to the panelists, and they'll work to answer the question during the session and at the conclusion conclusion of the session. As a reminder, your camera and your microphone are turned off. The panelists cannot see or hear you. So if you do have any questions, type them in through that Q&A button only. We encourage you to sign up for the panels that run through this evening. And then uh, the 6 by 6 virtual college fair runs tomorrow. The 6 by 6 virtual college fair is going to highlight about 120 colleges, each presenting for about six minutes on their institution. And they're doing so uh, within a 45 minute period. So you can go to strivescan.com Missouri, the same place you went to register for this panel, to check out the 6 by 6 fair for tomorrow. And finally, we are recording this session and all of the sessions, and those recordings will be posted by Friday of this week at strivescan.com slash Missouri, that exact same website you went to register for today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to the panelists for the College 101 panel for today. All right. Well, thank you, Zach. I appreciate that. Well, good evening and thank you for joining us. So the title of our session is College Planning 101. And we're really looking forward to sharing advice with you and recommendations. We also plan to answer any questions that you have surrounding this college planning process. Because we realize that to determine which colleges best fit your goals and your personality, your academic profile, and even your budget, some days it's exciting, and then other days it's very overwhelming, and we understand that. So during this session, we are gonna answer a series of questions that we usually hear from students. And we think by answering those for you, it will help you navigate this college search process. We have assembled a wonderful um, and very knowledgeable group of panel members. So at this time, I'd like you to meet everybody. So I'll go first. My name is Jamie Staggs. I am a regional admissions counselor for the University of Memphis. I am a first generation college student and I have been an admissions counselor for over 20 years. Darren, your turn. Hello, uh, my name is Darren Meeker. I am in my third year on the high school side with Rockhurst High School over in Kansas City. Um, so working on the college counselor, working specifically with high school students, sending them out into the world. Um, and then before that, I was, I spent four years at uh, Truman State University up in Kirksville on the admissions side, recruiting everyone to, uh, to Truman. So it's been a, it's been a fun seven years and just keep on rolling. And good evening, everybody. My name is Tim Eggleston. I'm the St. Louis based uh, admissions representative for the University of Missouri, also known as Mizzou. Um, I have been, gosh, how long have I been working in admissions? I think it's about 11 years now. So they, they, they just start rolling by, but I'm th thrilled to, to be with you all and, and um, eager to just kind of talk generally about, uh, about college. So thank you all for being here. And chat, are you with us this evening? Okay, well, Chat Leonard uh, will be joining us and she is a college counselor with Metro Academic High School. All right, so what I'd like to do, is I'm gonna move on to the next slide to really the bulk of our presentation. And so what I plan or what the panel plans to do is I'm going to be asking a series of questions, questions that we get often, you know, maybe even weekly. And so I'm hoping that the answers to these questions will really help guide you because chances are you have some of the same questions and you're either you've asked your counselor, you've asked a friend or you're going to. So I really hope that this does um, assist you. Also, please know that we welcome your questions. So you are definitely welcome to use that Q&A feature to type in any questions that you may have. And as they're received, I'll read them aloud and the panel will have an opportunity to answer them for you. So with that, what I'd like to do is get started with the first question. And due to COVID, we're hearing this question a lot. 
So the question is, should I take the ACT or SAT? Because I know some of you have had a hard time testing and now you wanna know if a college is test flexible, test optional, um, test blind, what should you do? And so Darren, can you take this question and share some advice on should a student take the ACT or SAT? Yeah, I think first off, uh, generally speaking, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two um, in, the, in the grand realm of things. Um, ACT has a science section. So if you, if you like the sciences more, maybe that one over SAT. Um, but as far as taking it for the admissions uh, kind of process in general, it's changing all the time. Uh, and we are, even now we're starting to hear what schools are planning to do for the future. Um, I am not an over like over planner or anything, but I think it is always super beneficial to have it in your back pocket, regardless of if you're applying to schools that are test optional, test flexible, test blind, which we, we uh, can cover those, uh, I guess, terms here in a little bit as well. Um, but uh, I, I think it's good to have that in your back pocket. And then after you've taken it once, you, you have that flexibility to decide if you wanna take it again, 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 or if you wanna take one ACT, one SAT. Um, it, it's a lot of kind of personal choice and figuring out for yourself. I know personally, I took the first one on my birthday, uh, which I don't recommend, avoid that at all costs if you can. And then the second one I, I was through my school. Um, and after that I was done. Um, and so I know some people have a goal and they're like, I wanna get there. Um, but I think as far as the college kind of planning process, uh, taking it at least once and then seeing how you do, how it fits into your own personal search is going to be key in making sure that, that you're, you're setting yourself up for success with the schools that you're looking for. Okay. And panel, if at any time you want to add a comment, you are certainly welcome to just unmute and we'll go from there. Thank you, Darren. That was very good advice because I think our policies are constantly evolving when it comes to SAT and ACT being required. So the next question we have is, if a student only has like three or four hours to spend on a college campus, what's the best use of their time? How can they get the best feel and know whether that is a college they should keep on their list? And with that, Tim, do you mind taking that question? Sure. Gosh, I feel like we could talk so much about the college visit, but in the interest of time, I think the first question I always ask students uh, to reflect on is, is what is important to you um, in the college search? Because I think sometimes that's a helpful first question to ask before I kind of extend general advice to students. You know, what are you looking for in a college? What do you think is going to be important to you? And then generally, we, we usually colleges of have a, a typical sort of setup anytime you want to come for an in-person tour. Uh, we usually offer, uh, you know, maybe a 30-minute info session where we're going to talk about admission requirements and applying and scholarships and involvement opportunities. We'll have a, you know, 45 minutes to an hour long walking tour of the campus. So you're going to get a, you know, a, a general sense of the physical layout of the campus. Uh, some colleges will even, you know, let you grab some lunch in the dining hall. I always like to encourage uh, students to try to spend as much time as you can with current students on a college campus. Uh, we've seen obviously with COVID-19, we've kind of been able to do a lot of things virtually to, you know, maybe normally a student couldn't, you know, take a, a day out of their evening or uh, some hours out of their evening to, you know, come to St. Louis to sit on a panel to talk to students. Uh, about their experience on the college, but now we have Zoom. So I think if you come to campus, oftentimes uh, be prepared with some questions for current students. Hey, how did you know this was the right fit for you? What surprised you about coming to college at University A, College B? What did you get involved with? If you're looking at a really big school with, you know, 30, 40,000 students, how did you, you know, make that school feel smaller? What's it like being a, a student um, here on campus. I always think two little subtle things, pick up a student newspaper, see what, you know, what's going on socially, what are students talking about uh, to make sure you're socially distanced. Uh, but also if you can, maybe try to eavesdrop on some student conversations. There's lots of more informal ways that you can really get a sense of a college visit. But I'm, I'm a big believer, definitely come away with uh, some opportunities where you've actually heard from current students because they were sitting Right where you all are, uh, those of you that are tuning in this evening, 
uh, the, the current students are the, really the experts in this process and, and share a lot of really great insights, I think. So I'll keep it brief in that uh, regard, but there's lots of things we can talk about in terms of visiting a campus. Yes, and I think one of the limitations in this question was if you had three to four hours, I mean, really, we want you to spend as much time as you can and not just check out the university, but the city or the community and what resources would be available to you if you chose that, you know, you selected that university. So do as much as you can. Um, hopefully you kind of have a list of things that you're really looking for that you can um, check out when you visit a campus. All right, it looks like our next question. It says, with thousands of colleges, and literally there are thousands, uh, guys, with thousands of colleges in the United States, how does a student go about finding their perfect school? Okay, so I'm going to turn this question over to chat. And then chat, if you want to introduce yourself too, that would be great. Hi, everyone. I apologize for my tardiness. I had some technical difficulties, but they're resolved now. My name is Chat Leonard. I'm the Director of College Counseling at Metro Academic and Classical High School. That's always a mouthful to say. It's right down the street from St. Louis University. And um, that is a very interesting question. How do I go about finding my perfect school? Well, this is just my opinion, but I don't think a perfect school actually exists unless it's in your mind or your perception because the uh, search process is imperfect. You as students are constantly changing uh, based upon your needs and your interest and uh, your desires. So what you think you might want in a college right now may change come uh, fall when you start applying to colleges and change again once you actually start making your commitment during um, the spring of your senior year. When I'm working with students and um, they have that perfect school in mind, they usually fall into two different categories. We have the, um, uh, the checklister and they've got a list of 10 criteria and uh, the colleges have to meet the 10 criteria or you know it doesn't make their list. And don't laugh because you have friends who are checklisters and you may be a checklister yourself. So um, you know, I say keep an open mind, uh, maybe uh, 10 criteria, that's a whole lot. Maybe pare that down to maybe four or five that's most important to you. If a college meets six out of 10 criteria, in my opinion, that ain't bad. So don't disregard a, a college or discount a college because it doesn't meet every single criteria on your list. Um, you might be missing a really great opportunity. Uh, another category of students I work with looking for that perfect college uh, is the uh, student who's hyper fixated on that dream school. I've got to go to this dream school, and if I don't, it's all over. And um, you know what I tell that student is that, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, proverbially speaking, and it's okay to have a dream school. It's okay to have one or two dream schools. However, you need to have a balanced list. Uh, you need to think about, you know, schools that um, are likely schools or safety schools, uh, schools that are mid-range, probable schools, and it's okay to uh, you know, have two or three schools that, that are REACH schools. But if you're uh, hyper-focusing on one REACH school, especially if that school is super, super competitive, you may be setting yourself up for uh, disappointment. And that's what the uh, search process is all about, uncovering the possibilities of what can be. Thank you, chat. And I feel like this next question is just kind of piggybacks off your answer. So the next question we had was about how many colleges uh, should a student apply to? And I feel like it's worth repeating. She answered it. It's um, you wanna have your ideal school, a good fit. Um, it's a school that you could possibly be admitted to based upon your academic profile. And it maybe meets, um, uh, meets six of the 10 criteria that's on your list. So you want to apply to a couple that are a good fit. And then maybe you want that reach school or that dream scroll, one that's maybe a little bit further of a reach. It uh, could be academically a little further away, a little more financially, a little more, something like that. And then I feel like you also need the backup plan, um, one or two that are still a good fit, um, but maybe not your first or second choice. 
So when a student asks me how many students or how many colleges should I apply to, a lot of times I recommend around five because that way they have their backup plan, their good fit and their reach somewhere in those five, hopefully. That's what I really recommend. I know I've had some students who've applied to up to 30 um, colleges. I feel like that's, a, that's pretty stressful uh, to be applying to that many schools. And then when some students tell me they applied to only one, that concerns me too, because I feel like you don't, that may not be not enough options. Um, you wanna get yourself a couple paths. And as you go through your senior year and you see where you're admitted, hopefully you can kind of lay them on the table and see which path meets your hopes, your goals, your expectations, your budget the best. And then those that are, you know, checking off the criteria, keep them on the table. So my advice is around five, um, kind of just depends on you, but I don't know about 30. All right, let's see. Um, a couple questions coming in too, if anybody wants to take this one. What is a super score? Um, does anybody want to take that or do you want me to? Uh, all right, I'll, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if you think, uh, I, I kind of always explain a, a super score. Let's say you've taken the ACT, you take the ACT three times. Um, and the first time you took it, you earned, you earned your highest math score, your math sub score. The second time you took it, you earned your highest reading and um, English sub score. And then the fourth, third time you took it, you earned your highest science reasoning score. They're going to look across all three of those tests to kind of pluck out those higher, highest sub scores that occurred over those three standardized tests. And then ACT is going to average them basically for you uh, to create a super score, basically your highest uh, average of all of those scores. So yeah, and that's a, a really good question to ask when you're um, meeting with colleges. Do you super score on standardized tests? What is your policy that way? Um, but yeah, I just think of it as you kind of get your um, your best foot forward in all of those different uh, subsections and colleges will reward you for that. And real quick to add on to that, I have been surprised by the number of schools, especially on the coast, that will only super score the SAT, but will not super score the ACT. So just because they say they super score doesn't always imply that they do both tests. So just make sure you're asking those clarifying questions and making sure that, that you're 100% certain on, on their policies. Very good. Another, Another question, I, excuse oh, go me. Go ahead, Chad. Another thing I'd like to add is that um, sometimes you need to be str strategic, hard to say, uh, in the super scoring process because if you're applying to a highly competitive school and uh, you uh, earned a science uh, subscore of a 29 or 30, but your composite score is only a 23 and your other composite scores were, uh, you know, 29 or 30, do you really want to send that 23 with that 29 science uh, subtest to that college? So sometimes there's a strategy to that. Definitely. Great advice. Uh, another question uh, submitted. Will colleges understand students' grades from this past semester, and we can say the past year, because of COVID? So I would say from a college perspective, as someone who looks at applications and reviews them, yes, our review criteria has been evolving with the situation. And we realize that not every high school is handling it the same. And so a lot of times we'll say that we have a comprehensive review that means we're trying to look at all the factors that affected your transcript, your scores. If you write an essay, that gives you an opportunity to tell us certain things and share more information with us. I would say if you have a unique situation and your transcript doesn't um, give us enough details, let those college admission counselors or off admissions offices maybe know a little bit more about your situation and what we may be seeing on a transcript um, that needs further description, okay? Don't hesitate to share that information with us. Does anybody wanna add anything else? Okay, all right. Um, another question I have is, what are the differences in college application type? So there's a lot, 
yeah, we're not all the same. There's a lot of different options out there. Darren, would you tell them a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, I mentioned it in one of my responses earlier that I think went to everybody is higher education is a giant bowl of alphabet soup. Uh, we throw all kinds of acronyms and, and everything around. So if there's ever any questions on any what something means, never hesitate to ask. And I, I catch myself, I did it earlier with a response for SuperScore. In my meetings with students, I do the same thing. It, it's So don't be afraid to ask. So that being said, um, just a, a, a sample. Uh, there's early decision, restrictive early action, early action, regular decision, rolling. Um, there, there's all kinds of different plans. Um, and they all have different restrictions with them uh, um, or no restrictions. Um, so the, the most intense is early decision or ED. Um, and that is basically saying that I know 100% if I get accepted to the school, I am going because you're showcasing to that school by applying ED that you have extreme interest in them. So they know that if they admit you, you're going. Um, so there's kind of that, that uh, agreement there that if you get accepted, you're going. Um, restrictive early action is kind of like that, but with, oh, oh, the other big important thing with ED is you cannot apply to any other ED schools. So you get one ED school, that's it. Restrictive early action works basically the same way, except for it doesn't have that binding agreement. So it just says you can't apply to any other REA or ED schools. Um, early action is literally just applying early. It's saying, hey, I'm really interested in you, so I'm going to apply two months early um, by that early action deadline. So there's no, it's not binding. It doesn't mean that you're committed or anything. It is simply saying, I want to apply early. I want to get my decision early. Um, I'm a little bit extra interested in your school versus these other schools that I'm applying to. Um, and so it, it's kind of nice because you hear back usually, uh, not all the time, but a lot of times before Christmas break or during Christmas break. So you hear back uh, you know, before a lot of your friends will. Um, as far as regular decision, that deadline is typically in the January, February range. Um, so you get a little bit of extra time. So maybe you had some rough semesters and you want to get that, that first semester of senior year grades in, or you want to wait and take the ACT or SAT one more time to apply. You can do that regular decision. Um, and that, that's just applying a little bit later. Um, and they, they still have those specific deadlines. And usually, hopefully, you hear back by, uh, by spring break. Rolling admission is literally just apply anytime, you're good to go, it doesn't matter. Um, and that, so like Truman State, uh, when I worked there, you know, we, our application would open August 1, we would get applications August 1st, and then next year, August like 15th, the day before move-in, students could still be applying and being admitted. Um, and so I, I think that, that all of these different plans are gonna fit different students in different ways. And I think again, like we're, it's kind of a theme, um, and I say this a lot, is that every school is different, um, but also making sure that you find that that thing that fits you best um, and finding that, that application plan and working with your college counselors and your admissions folks, um, because there's lots of dates, lots of deadlines, and making sure that you stay on top of it is key. Um, so I know that was a lot real quick, um, and I don't expect you to remember all the, all the acronyms and everything, but that's what we're here for once you dive into the process. That was great information. I'll remind everyone, this is being recorded. So later, if you want to access it, you can pull it back up and listen to Darren's descriptions again. Okay. I have a couple more questions that are coming in from students. One of them, and we hear this quite a bit, what if I don't test well on the standardized tests, such as the ACT or SAT? And that's where I would try to remind you that a lot of us, we call it comprehensive review. We're not just looking at the ACT and SAT. We also look at your high school transcript. Some universities will want to know more. Um, your volunteer work, what you were involved in, did you have a job? So um, each one of them is a little different, but we do try to take a lot of different things into consideration, okay? Because we realize that you may have a 3.5, but yet you didn't get the ACT or SAT score you really wanted that's compatible. We understand that. Um, so please don't worry too much. Um, those scores do have quite a bit of weight with some universities, but at others, no, they're taking a holistic view of you academically. Okay, okay. I'm gonna ask another question. Let's see here. 
how can students acquire the most accurate, and that's the key word, accurate and useful information about colleges? Because I know sometimes they come up to me and say, I heard this or I saw this. And I'm thinking, where did you get that from? So Tim, can you stress how students should acquire the most accurate information? Absolutely. So I, I kind of think of it as um, kind of three, three general phases, but there's kind of miniature steps within each phase. So first one, I say, you know, go online, do some research. Uh, if you have that uh, capability to do so, um, oftentimes it might help just by trying to categorize colleges, you know, the size of the college. Is it, does it have 40,000 students? Does it have 1,500 students? Uh, the distance uh, that you're willing to, or interested in going from uh, going away from from home. Is it, you know, 10 hours away? Is it, you know, 10 minutes down the road? Costs and financial aid, you know, trying to do a little bit of research in, in terms of scholarships, um, majors and academic opportunities. You know, I know for me, I get questions from students interested in criminal justice. Well, the zoo doesn't have criminal justice. So I usually direct them to any number of schools that do so. Uh, and then atmosphere too. So it could be those kind of five initial criteria, but it could be you know, hey, if I want to major in um, business, can I still be a part of the marching band at this college? So just kind of start to reflect and imagine what you want your college experience to look like. Go online, do a little bit of research, try to carve out some time if you can once a week, you know, a couple hours a week, a couple hours every couple of weeks. So go online, do a little bit of research. I'd say secondarily to your point, Jamie, come right to the source, uh, you know, call, start by calling an admissions counselor talking to, you know, perhaps a high school counselor about this process. Really, that's one of my big takeaways is knowing that you're not alone in this. You have a lot of really great resources available to you, people that have been through this experience themselves. So come directly to the source and, and other advisors that you have uh, in your life to assist you. And then, um, so, so going online, then talking to an actual representative. And then third, once you get to that point, if you're able to, if you'd like to come for an in-person tour or take some virtual tours, things like that, I think oftentimes the, the, that in-person tour, which we know has been greatly limited this year, uh, but we know that it can kind of provide a, a test drive of sorts to see how you feel as you walk around. So I think that would be kind of the, the general sort of advice I would give is certainly go online, you know, but when you hear a rumor like that, come and ask us. Like, we'll, we, we talk, we like to talk very frankly um, about, about uh, student experience and what students have, have heard. So just come directly to us. We're happy to help. Perfect. All right, our next question. So we talked a little bit about trying to help students narrow down their search. So what strategies could we recommend for students to help narrow down their list even more to maybe their top five or their top 10? Chat, do you have some advice to share? Oh, that's a great question. And I always have to unmute myself minutes before I start talking because I am notorious for talking if I'm muted, so it's lip syncing. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I say that you probably should start first by being very selfish or maybe that um, self-focused, self-reflective and think about what do you want um, out of the college experience. So you need some time to, th to think about that. Um, there are so many criteria that you could use to start narrowing down, um, you know, what kind of college is the right college for you. However, um, I usually like to start with the basics. Um, I tell my students to think about, you know, what they want out of a college experience. Uh, think about the size of the school. And we're talking about undergraduate population. We're not talking about Mizzou's law school or med school or vet school. We're talking about undergraduate population. Uh, usually if you're talking about 3000 or less, that's a small school. So think Rockhurst University, uh, think uh, Webster University or Maryville or Fontbonne. Uh, if you um, are interested in a larger school, and let's just say that you want a school that uh, there are a lot of social activities. The Greek system is alive and well. You want to go to a, a football game or a basketball game with thousands of students. And I don't know how that's going to pan out in this time of the uh, pandemic. But, uh, you know, a larger campus uh, may be uh, better for you. And you have zillions of courses to choose from. 
Um, however, in a large school, it would be a school like Mizzou, um, usually 8,000 plus, a mid-range school or mid-sized school, and we're not talking about the size of the, the, the campus, we're talking about undergraduate population, think a Truman or a WashU, 4 to 8,000. However, if you um, uh, don't want to be as anonymous as you could be on a larger campus, and for, set, for example, let's just say that you um, are taking a professor's class and in psychology, and you're interested in being uh, that professor's research assistant, uh, second semester of freshman year, or first semester sophomore year, and this is a professor that you may have uh, for a couple more years, uh, and that professor asks you, or you ask that professor, may I be a research assistant? Uh, that may not necessarily happen at a larger school. It could, but you, you would have to be uh, more proactive. So one size is not better than the other. It's just very different in what's right for you. Um, you know, I talk about location, size, location, and have a conversation with your parents about if you are able to matriculate out of state and how far you can go. Do you want to be in an urban setting like uh, uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, or Rockhurst near Kansas City, or uh, DePaul in Chicago, or would you want to be uh, in St. Louis, St. Louis University, or are you looking for, are you okay with a, um, a college in a college town like Mizzou, where most of the activities and the life is centered on campus? So that's something that you need to think about. So size, location, think about major programs, um, what you're interested in studying. However, you do not have to know what you want to major in before you choose the school. A lot of students are interested in, you know, two to three, four different things. And a lot of times you don't have to declare a major until your sophomore year. There are some programs like engineering or architecture you may have to apply to while you're in a high school and college, but you're not stuck in those programs. Um, so, you know, keep an open mind about what you want to major in. However, think about your interests, think about your uh, skill set, think about a, a, a career that you're interested in, and make sure that uh, the school has a number of those programs that you may be interested in. Think about admission requirements. You know, how does my academic profile match up to uh, the school's academic profile? But don't let that be a barrier, uh, because uh, as Jamie said, you know, uh, schools are holistic in their admissions uh, approach. So if you have a dream school, but you feel like, oh, I don't have the test scores or I don't have uh, a lot of the AP classes, don't let that be a, a barrier. Finally, cost. And I think my colleagues would all agree is that we don't want cost to be an obstacle or a barrier because uh, there is financial aid. So if you look at the sticker price of a school, especially if it's an out-of-state public school like the University of Memphis, or if it's a private school, it's like, oh my gosh, there's no way my family's gonna be able to, uh, you know, to afford that. However, uh, there's merit-based and there's need-based financial aid. So apply to the school, apply for financial aid and merit-based scholarships and outside scholarships and see what happens. So size, location, uh, programs, um, uh, admission requirements, and cost. Fabulous. I kind of feel like we need to listen to her answer over and over again. One of you had asked um, if, where this recording would be available and you will receive an after the fact too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll make sure you can access it on our Missouri ACAC website. So great advice. Um, a couple other questions that have come in. Uh, when reviewing applications, what stands out on the personal statement or essay? One thing I would really pay attention to is we usually give you a prompt. The colleges usually um, try to help guide you on what to write about. So definitely read that. Don't just take off. Read the prompt and try to respond appropriately, appropriately to that prompt. Also, I would encourage you to have someone edit um, your response prior because I receive so many that have grammatical errors and um, it doesn't support your application when that happens pretty often. So definitely follow the prompt, um, have someone edit for you. Panel, if you wanna give a little more advice, you can. I've heard counselors mention the essay guy um, as a good resource. It can be found on a website if you just guide look up the essay guide and its guidance on how to write a good college essay. Go ahead, Darren. 
So uh, a, couple, a couple quick things, because I know we're running low on time. One, make sure you put the appropriate school name in for that school. The amount of times that when I worked at Truman and I re would receive essays that said University of Missouri or whatever other school was shocking. So make sure you check that. Um, and then two, write for you and who you are, not what you think the admissions committee wants to hear. Because the ones that stand out are the ones that are true to whoever it is that's writing. Um, you know, one of my favorite one of my favorites was a girl who wrote about her favorite Pokemon, Pikachu. That was fun. Um, and then another one was a very personal one where it was dealing with the the death of a of a friend and how that brought him closer to his mom. So again, very emotional piece, but like or a very emotional essay. But like that was true to him, and that is like. It, it let me know both of those in very different ways. Let me know more about them. And that is what is most beneficial um, and, and really showcases you as a student. All right, any other comment on that? Okay, I'll move on. Um, another question that is timely that we've been good, uh, getting is what are universities doing to protect our students uh, during a pandemic? And it kind of relates to one other question that came in too. One question was, um, are colleges still sending out information packet? Well, the answer is yes, we are. But you got to realize too, we're only at 20%, our, our university, it's only at 20% of our students are on campus and our staff. And so the staff that we usually have available to help prepare these publications and mail them and distribute them is not there on, on campus. And so we've all had to adjust to different things and how COVID has affected us, but do know we are sending out publications and um, don't worry, they, they are forthcoming. And then as far as what we're doing to protect you, a lot of, I mean, each college or university is going to share their policies with the students and they are changing weekly. So we make sure that our students are up to date on a weekly basis, whether it be wearing a mask, maybe right now we're only doing small group tours as a precaution, so yes, you can come in person and tour, but there's only going to be 10 people on your tour. So we're taking steps like that. We did offer students the opportunity to either come to class in person or do online or do a hybrid, depending on the class. So just know their safety is first and foremost, foremost, lots of extra cleaning. We're trying to make the vaccines available for all of our students right now. So just know, I mean, your, your health and well-being is of utmost importance. We want our students to be successful. And we had a lot of great resources that were offered in person that transitioned to completely online. And I can say a lot of all colleges are doing this. We just wanna make sure we're meeting our students' needs um, personally, professionally, educationally. Um, we want their mental health uh, to be good too. So just know we're doing all that we can. I would anticipate a lot of um, updates coming in the next few months. And so I'm guessing a lot of you are probably juniors. So again, you're just gonna have to watch and talk to us and see what kind of updates that we have to share for you. I know we're starting to see more on-campus big events where you used to go to these universities and there'd be a couple hundred students there checking us out. I don't know if we're up to a couple hundred, but we're getting there slowly but surely, maybe 50, maybe a hundred. So be watching for those opportunities to register soon and come, come take a tour. And I know earlier on there was a question too, will the campuses feel like normal? Well, no, they're not quite back to normal, um, but we're getting there again. And so when you do look at us, just keep that in mind. Uh, we're not at capacity, but, but we're returning as quickly as we can. Okay, um, let's see here. Another question we had. Um, let's see. Okay, if a student doesn't know, and we've touched on this a little bit, but I feel like we can mention it again because uh, we get it all the time. What if a student doesn't know what they want to choose as their major? What is your advice? Um, Darren, you feel like taking this one? Yeah, I, first off, you're going to be asked this question a bajillion times between now and the end of your life. So like, it, just get used to it. Be ready to answer whenever someone asks you. Um, I also think it's perfectly 100% okay to say undecided, undeclared. Um, chat covered it a little bit earlier. And I think like, there's such a stigma on forcing yourself to choose something. Um, and I, I think if you go in choosing a major that, that doesn't fit you and you just went with it, it could actually put you behind in your four-year plan. So I think making sure that, like I kind of said earlier, being true and honest to yourself, just making sure that if you're undecided, go in undecided. Almost, I won't say almost all, but a lot of schools that I'm aware of have 
um, undecided programs where they will work with you to do different assessments or whatever it may be to help you find that major and that career choice that are best for you. So don't be afraid to go in undecided. Um, I think it's kind of fun. I went in undecided, um, took a boatload of classes. I thought I was going to be a museum curator, a teacher. I thought all kinds of things like, um, and then through my campus job as a tour guide, I ended up finding admissions and, and, and the life of higher ed. So I think things work out no matter what. So don't be afraid to go in undecided. Very good. I'm trying to get through one or two more questions and then we have some resources we want to share with all of you. Okay, so another question would be, we mentioned it earlier, but you hear these terms, test optional, test blind, test flexible. So does test optional really mean test optional? Like if a student has a 3.5 GPA and they took honors classes, and so did another student, 3.5 and honors classes, but one student actually takes the ACT and submits it. How are we going to look at those two students? Like one submits a test score, one doesn't. Maybe one didn't do as well in the ACT. Um, this is a big question for all of us in, in higher ed this year. Tim, do you want to share some thoughts on that? Sure. And I... Uh... I think I would start by saying um, this is just kind of a good question to keep in your pocket ready to go this next year for every college that you consider because uh, as Jamie alluded to every every college is really going to have a different policy uh, and really even that term test optional what does that mean you have to kind of unpack that at, at just about every college you're considering because some colleges will say yes we're test optional for admission when you apply but in order to earn certain scholarships you may have to have a test score on file. So uh, on the other hand, there may be kind of, as you start to do some research online, you may see that there are formulaic admission criteria or formulaic scholarship criteria where if you have this test score and this GPA, you automatically received a scholarship. Well, that's a little bit more direct than when a college says, yes, we're going to holistically review students who are applying test optional for scholarships, where holistic is weighing a number of different factors. It's kind of a catch-all term that, you know, they may look at your, uh, the core, obviously your high school transcript, the courses that you've taken, taken, the types of courses, looking maybe at a school profile, they're looking at that essay, they're looking at a personal statement. So they're looking at a lot of different things and there's usually not one thing that necessarily determines that admission or that scholarship. So it's, it's a little bit tougher to get that clear answer, I think, when you're considering the test optional pathway versus the test score pathway. But you're right, Jamie, it is something that we're, we're all talking about quite a bit this year. Um, but those would be just a few of the things I, I, would, uh, I would mention. And I welcome my uh, colleagues to, to join in too if you have additional thoughts. And I've encouraged students too to reach out to those schools that are at the top of their list and just ask us or email us or text us, whatever you like. Um, and we can give you a little guidance because there may be, I may give you one answer a little bit for my university and Tim's may be a little bit different. Um, that's just, just how it goes. So we only have a few moments left. So what I'd like to do is share some resources with you. We want you to be able to um, take a screenshot or access this later and chat if you wanna tell them about a few of the resources and then the rest of us will jump in. Well, yeah, um, the Barron's Profile of American College is, it's like the Webster uh, Dictionary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're listed in alphabetical order by state. And uh, you can, um, you know, find out where a college is uh, located, uh, how large the college is in terms of population on the undergraduate level. It'll tell you about tuition, how competitive the school is. They usually give you an ACT or an SAT range. So, uh, it's a, a very comprehensive um, resource. Uh, I like the books of uh, majors by the college board. And uh, so all kinds of majors that you never even thought existed. And uh, 
uh, they're listed uh, usually uh, by uh, alphabet, uh, by state and by college. And the Fisk Guide to Colleges, I love that book. I love that book uh, because you get uh, inside information from a lot of times from the student perspective and you're not going to have the uh, shirts and the ties and the coats from the admissions office is telling you what the college is like. You're getting the inside good stuff from uh, the students. So I really do like that. Uh, you know, information with regard to popular programs and the social life and what, what can you do off campus and, um, and traditions that schools may have. So I really like that uh, resource as well. Okay, well, real quick, you. college oh. counselors and yeah, admissions counselors. Oh, you go. go ahead. Go ahead, wrap it up, Darren. Okay. Final okay. thoughts. I was gonna say, I was gonna go go my Finding Nemo route for college counselors and admissions <laughs> counselors. We are your friends, not food. Um, so make sure you, you are asking us questions. We're here for you. We wanna help you out. I know not every school is, is lucky enough to have college counselors, but there's a high school counselor. There, there's someone there that can help you. And if not, that's what your admission counselors there are there for. So make sure you're reaching out to them and asking questions because that is literally what we're here for is to help you get through this process that can be severely overwhelming at times. Well, thank you so much, Tim, Darren, Chat, Jamie. Uh, thank you for spending your afternoon uh, evenings teaching us about the college search process. Students and families, thank you for tuning in as well. When you close uh, this box, a very brief four question survey will appear. We do ask for your feedback on this session. We also have uh, another hour, or actually two hours of panels starting at six o'clock central in 15 minutes. We've got a financial aid and scholarships 101 panel. And then at seven o'clock, there is a highly selective admissions panel and a career awareness for high school students panel. So we encourage you to visit strivescan.com slash Missouri to check out those programs for today. If you keep scrolling beyond the panels, you'll see the college fair for tomorrow where there are 120 colleges presenting for three hours. And uh, I believe Tim will be there, right? Jamie will be there. Mm -hmm. You'll get to see yes. your college rep friends then to uh, have them speak on their own institutions, plus uh, 208 more colleges. So we hope you'll join us all tomorrow as well. So thank you all for joining us for this Missouri ACAC program and have a safe night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.